Can they hear me out in the parking lot? All right. Maybe we're there, Tommy. Hopefully. hopefully. No, not hopefully. We're trusting in Jesus. We're trust, there you go. <laughs> Devil's been fighting us this morning. All right. Um, if you will, this morning, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Isaiah. We're going to look at chapter 53. It's going to be our focal passage this morning, verses 1 through 12. Um, now, one of the things that was a reality growing up in West Virginia is that once fall came, it seemed like the rains kind of set in and it kind of stayed damp and muddy. There wasn't enough sunshine and all to keep it dry. And um, that lasted most of the fall and winter. And Growing up with two older brothers and even my older sister and all, one of the things we liked was football. And so, you know, my father had a small garden out in the side yard. And so once he got that garden cleaned up, the side yard was wide open. And like I say, you get a garden cleaned up, there's plenty of good mud out there to be playing football in and everything. And so we go out there. Well, I was the youngest. And so that meant always one of my older brothers, if we were playing football, were covering me. And so my one brother got the bright idea. We'll go, let's go out there and we'll practice. That way, when you, your older brother comes out there, you'll be able to beat him. And um, so that's what we did. And Well, the end zone was, the back of the end zone was my dad's hedges. The sidelines was either our house or the house next door. And then in the end zone was mom's rose bush. And so my brother came up with all these plays to use all those obstacles to keep my other brother from getting the football. And uh, needless to say, you got real quick and your reflexes got real good at how to dodge the house, the hedges, the rose bush and everything. So, you know, traction was a main thing and all that mud. So like I say, that, but they, I think they really had a good time just trying to see how many times they could make me hit the house or hit the hedges and, you know, being older brothers, being what they were. But um, I got more coordinated and a little bit tougher and a lot of scratches, but we got there. But um, this morning, the, the focus of that whole thing is getting traction. And we're going to talk about that this morning. So if you will, um, if you're able, um, stand with me. We read Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12 says, Who hath believed it our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my, righteousness, my, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Let us pray. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you. And Father, this morning as we join together, I pray that our hearts are lifted and turned to you. May our ears be attentive to you, O Lord. May your Holy Spirit speak to us through your word. Father, it's not about me, it's about you. And may your words be spoken in all things. Bless this service this morning, and may we give you the glory. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, November 11th is Veterans Day. Now, one of the symbols when I was looking at the different things about Veterans Day was I saw a pair of boots with an American flag sticking up out of them. So the title of the message this morning is Caliga, which I'll explain what it is. Many of you may not ever even know what the Caliga is. It, it, in a sense, it is the foundation of this message this morning. Ephesians 6 and 15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what does Caliga have to do with Ephesians 6, 15? Well, if you remember, you know, Paul spent a good bit, bit of time in prison, along with some of the other apostles. They're in and out of prisons. And if you're in prison, you would have been guarded by the Roman soldiers, and you would have got used to hearing this metal grating sound. And that was as the Roman soldiers, foot soldiers, were walking down the, the brick and the stone floors. For Caliga is the name of the shoes that they wore. Matter of fact, they're you know, quite unique in... It made the Romans very successful. You think, well, how can boots make the difference or shoes make a difference? Well, they do make a difference. And many would say that they would rival the modern military boot in the way that they were made. See, we often, you know, see pictures of soldiers and, you know, the Roman soldiers, and we see what we think are sandals on their feet. But it's not sandals. What was issued to them was an open-faced boot that laced up the front. And the open face allowed the air to get into their feet so that they would keep dry and wouldn't have mold and fungus and have foot disease from marching. So it helped them. Now, socks were not worn as a roll and all, but, as a, but when they did go on up into Britain, we forget about the Romans being all the way up into Britain, they did start wearing socks with those boots. And what socks did they wear? They wore a woolen sock, which is what many mountain climbers and um, military groups do today. I know that because we as a company make some for these different uses because the wool helps to wick away the moisture and protect your feet. They realized that the feet were very important. But the other thing about the Caliga was it was three layers of leathers bonded together on the bottoms and in the bottom they had iron hobnails that stuck out. And that sole purpose of those iron hobnails sticking out was traction. When they pushed against the enemy, their feet didn't move. They dug in like cleats. And, all. and so if you can't get traction, you can't fight. If you can't stick, you know, push against something, you can't win the war. And part of what made the Romans successful was their footwear, believe it or not, as many people overlook some details. So this morning, Paul is using this image in the message of what we're talking about here. Right we're in this vision 615 gives the image of the feet. And if we look at the um, armor, the Christian armor, we see that feet, footwear is important to it. And so as soldiers, Paul's given us a visual image that they could relate to to help us understand the importance of ours. Not so much our feet, but the preparation of the gospel. If I were to ask you, as we read the opening scripture, how many of you, with each and every verse, you know, thought more and more about Jesus? That's one of the great prophecies of Jesus is in Isaiah. It talks a great deal about him. And if we are going to carry the message, then we need to recognize the message. And we need to have it prepared within our heart. See, the enemy's going to fight you at every turn. If you don't think you're in a battle, you're, you're, you're an illusion. You know, if you walk out on the street today, people, you know, I don't want to say they're 
conflict, but Satan's going to use people to stifle the, the gospel. He's going to do his best to stop it. And if he can put doubts in your head, he's going to do it. If he can make somebody challenge you that you'll back down, he's going to do it. But we need to be prepared. Preparation of the gospel is a term that's used. Jesus was prophesied a great deal. If you, as a matter of fact, Paul would go and speak to the Jews and use these type of prophecies and all to explain to them Jesus. And all. He would say, this is what the prophet Isaiah said. This is the Jesus I'm talking about. And he would explain to them the gospel using the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, that same technique is done today um, by groups that evangelize Jewish people. They use the same technique that Paul used then. When I was a when I was in youth group, I remember a group of them coming. I can't remember the name of the group, but they talked about how they were winning Jews to Jesus. And they weren't using the New Testament. They were using the Old Testament because it spoke so much of him. But did you hear the crucifixion? Did you see the imaging that there that prophet Isaiah spoke about? Did you hear the good news? Did you realize the sacrifice? See, the question of it is, is how many of you are prepared to carry the gospel? It's as important today as it ever was, probably more so. For each day we approach closer to the end. See, the world today is bent on destruction and negativity. You don't see many stories in the news talking about good things. Matter of fact, you'll find people are always quicker to talk about the bad than they are the good. Negativity is a big thing. But as Christians, being prepared is not a terrible thing. It's not like when you're in high school cramming for that test and stayed up all night or getting ready for the SATs or whatever. It's not that type of preparation. And you can read and memorize all the scriptures you want. But if you do not live them, then you're not prepared. You're just informed. To me, Christians are informed, but not prepared. To me, people say they know Jesus, but really they just know of him. One of the things I've, uh, recently, if you were watching, if you're one of those that watch Jeopardy or whatever, the millions of dollars, I forget, 38 days or whatever the gentleman won. He had a great deal of knowledge. But, you know, I wonder sometimes if he's got all that knowledge... How does he really live? Does he put it to use, or is it just trivia to him? You know, it was, used to be one of the popular games, Trivia Pursuit. There's all kinds of things and all. But the knowledge is not what makes things happen. It's the actions. You can have all the knowledge of Jesus you want, but if he's not real to you, it's just knowledge. The Bible is just a book until you make it alive. People don't want to hear titles. They don't want to hear speeches. They don't want you to come up and just speak words. What they want to see is action. If you never thought that you lived in a glass house, you're wrong. The world watches all those they call to be Christians because they want to do everything they can to cast them down if they can. Scripture tells us no weapon formed against us will prevail if we're living for Jesus. And the gospel, and one of the gospels we're going to focus on is the gospel of peace if we're talking about veterans that many went to fought wars and battles and around the world. But one of the use of the gospel, it's called the gospel of peace. You also see the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel of grace. And all these are descriptions and all are knowledge but they're all worthless unless you put something to them. Romans 10, 14 through 15. It says, How then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Preaching the gospel is, is carrying the gospel, carrying it in our daily lives. See, we like to, when they use that word preach, we think, oh, well, that's just a preacher's job. That's not what it's talking about. Preaching is just declaring the gospel. And we each are called to declare the gospel to others. We each are called to carry it. The Great Commission wasn't just given to preachers. It was given to all Christians. We all are to carry the gospel. A person who complains is negative does not have the gospel of peace. If you get Christians in the church and all they do is complain and look at the bad things, they don't have the gospel of peace. No, they're letting the world complain or control them. Because they're complaining because it's not what they want. They're not getting what they want. No, living in the gospel of peace reminds us that God is in control. When bad things happen, God is still in control. When challenges come, God is still in control. See, we like to think, well, if this would have happened, I wouldn't have this problem. Now, we're blinded by the forest. We can't see it all. I'm so glad that God sees the other side. I'm so glad that he chose the path that I should travel, that you should travel. Because I guarantee you, if those things had happened that I thought should have happened, I'd probably been in a deeper hole than I already was in at times. Because our wisdom is limited to what we can see, what we know right now. But God knows our tomorrows. God knows all things. You can face a, a challenge and complain about it, or you can face a challenge and you can go through it with a smile on your face. It's just your, it's your choice. We forget that we can choose what attitude we're going to have. A lot of people think something bad happens, they automatically have to get mad and angry and complain. That's not true. No. It's not true. Some of the craziest praise reports I've, I've given before is I'm glad I had a flat tire. I'm glad I had a busted alternator. And people look at me like I'm strange. But I was glad about it because it happened to me and not Karen when she was driving that vehicle. That I was the one that had to maintain control of the vehicle or I was the one that had to get it fixed and her not stranded somewhere. We can get upset about a lot of things. But does it help? Does, making, does getting angry make your problem go away? Does complaining make your problem go away? No, all it does is what? It just brings you down and depresses you and makes you worse. And what happens, we do it and we attack it like the world. We forget about what we have over here and in here. We forget about God. Because we're focused on the world and not focused on God. We're focused on the problem and not about God. I can tell you that there's bad things that have happened for a reason. Some are consequences. But sometimes God got to get you to a right spot to talk to somebody. He's got to get you to the right spot for you to show what being a Christian is. The question is, will you respond? Respond. Then you have the person in church that stirs up trouble and discord. They don't have the gospel of peace either. It's some, it seems like a lot of churches, I won't say all, but a lot of churches always have somebody who wants to stir something up. And it's not edifying to the church. It's not building up the church. It's creating havoc in the church. And Satan's using that person. It's not building the unity, but tearing it down. There's a lot of people that use churches in a self-serving manner. A person who sits and keeps himself, they don't have the gospel of peace either. Quiet churches, a lot of them don't have the gospel of peace. You say, well, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. How many of you have ever had something really good happen to you? I mean, really good. That when it happened, you just got excited and just sort of bounced up and down and we're all excited. The 
There's days that I couldn't stop talking after we had our children. Those were some of the most exciting days of my life. I want everybody to know I had a child that day. Or Karen had the child. I was just there. <laughs> I was there for support, you know. <laughs> but I was excited about it. It was great. You know, I have a son. I have a daughter. I have another son. If Jesus is the greatest thing that ever happened to you, how can you keep quiet? Was the only exciting the day you got saved? Did he stop? As the good things of Christ stop just because you got saved and say, oh, well, all the good times are over? No. So silent Christians don't have the gospel of peace either. Because they're not having they don't have the good news in them. The quiet and collusive person may know all about the good news, but they don't have it in their lives. We as Christians are to go out. And that's why Paul talks about, if you go into the other scriptures, he talks about the spiritual army. He's saying we're, go, we're to go out, we're to move. And I remember as a young boy, one of the things, we, we did this activity as a youth, and you know, they brought in rolls of tinfoil and cardboard and said, okay, make this you know, spiritual armor. Yeah, and we may all made it. And the um, youth director was very quick and says, there is no protection for the back in the spiritual armor. All the protections on the front. He says the only direction a Christian to go is forward. There's no retreat. He says we are to move forward. And that was the message at night. That we're to carry it forward. We are protected. So now we've talked about several of the things over the last couple of weeks. Talking about unity and everything else. And one of the things is God's word. God's word is the truth that should fill our life. So is, do you have a truthful life? Are you filled with God's word? I'm not talking about his truth of man. I mean, there's man's truth, but I guarantee a lot of man's truth is false. Because man's truth is evolution, not creation. But are we filled with God's word? Is that what girds us up? Do we have the righteousness of Christ or do we have man's righteousness? We have a lot of people that walk around with puffed out chests and saying, I'm righteous. Most of them are self-righteous. Not righteous in Christ. How many of you have been given the gift of grace and accept it? I say accept it because a lot of people have been offered the gift of grace. They never fully embrace it. They never grab hold of it and make it a part of it. And so I come back to the preparation of the gospel of peace. It says, my question is, are you prepared to present the gospel? Do you present the gospel? And I'm not talking about some handbook or some written down thing. What I'm talking about is, can you share Jesus Christ, the good news from your heart? Can you tell others what Jesus has done for you? Can you show Jesus' love in the way that you live, in the way that you walk, in the way that you talk? Or do they just see you pull into the church parking lot and say, yeah, they must be a Christian. They go there on Sundays. Are you prepared to carry it? Are your feet shod, ready to walk forward? Or do you just kind of shy away? Are you in the battle or are you out of it? If you're not being confronted with Satan in the battle, then I question whether you're in it at all. It's an all out war. See, we have to be prepared. We have to be carrying the gospel. And you're in the way that you live, the way that you speak, the way that you act is the gospel in a sense. And a lot of people say, well, if I just live a good life, they'll know everything they need to know. Well, yes and no. They may see a good person, but do they know why you're a good person? 
You may do good things, but do they know why you do good things? You can go into some major cities and go into different places and you'll see names on a building, you know, Carnegie Hall or, you know, such and such or this or that. And all these buildings named after these people, philanthropists have begun, gave great money for hospitals and libraries and all. And they purely did it. Yes, it was a good thing they did, but it was, had nothing to do with Jesus. It had nothing to do with a Christian act. It was for a self-righteous act. Do we do things to make ourselves look good? Or are we pointing the light on Jesus? Do they know that you love them because you're a person or because Jesus loves them? Somewhere you got to tell them. Somewhere you got to explain to them why. This past weekend and today, it will happen across this nation. People are going to jump to their feet and scream and yell like some of the craziest people you ever did see. All because their football team scored. They're excited over something that's going to last for 60 minutes. And they're going to go to work tomorrow or wherever they go, and they're going to talk about how great their team was and all the great things. But when you, you leave here today, will you go out and talk about all the great things of church? Not so much the service, but about Jesus. Are you as excited about Jesus as they are about that football score? Are you enthused enough to go out and tell them? Or are you just going to get back to your normal routine? See, we have to get excited. You have to have Jesus in your heart. You gotta have the gospel of peace. No matter what challenge comes, what battles are before you, no matter what heartache is there, Jesus is there. He can bring you through. Trust me, he's brought me through a many a valley. And he's brought many of you, as I've heard, talking with you too. And if he can do that, why are we not excited more about him? Why are we not sharing him more? Why are we not telling more? See, one of the things, I think it's the greed within us sometimes, maybe it's the selfishness, that we think if we tell somebody something good, then it lessens it. If I tell somebody about Jesus and they find Jesus, I'll have less Jesus for me. It don't work that way. Because think about where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is. Well, if everybody around you is a Christian or you witness them more and more, then every time you go up and you meet to them, guess who's right there? The nation needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus. And it is our job to get out and to carry it to show out our feet and go forward. A lot of Christians do not show their feet. Many are being pushed back into the sanctuaries and their homes and they're not going out. They're letting Satan close them in. So I challenge you today, get excited. And if you're doing good things, there's a lot of people that do good things and they do them for the right reasons, but make sure you tell the person why. That it's not about you, it's about Jesus. See, when there's excitement, you ever see something that happened down the street and see all this commotion? You know, you see all the flashing lights down the road and all these cars gathering, what happens? Everybody goes, goes down, all right? Or something exciting happened, they wanna see what's going on. What would happen if the churches started getting excited? What about when Christians go out and they say, why are they so excited? Why are they so happy? What do they got? Excitement draws people. More importantly, Jesus draws people. And if we're showing Jesus, we're showing him in our life, guess what? People are going to come. 
They're going to come ask you, why is it you have that happen and you're not upset? How come you're not mad? Why aren't you complaining? I would have told that person, and I'm like, and I've had that happen to me before. I had it happen to me at church in a business meeting one night. I came out of the business meeting, and a man came up to me and he says, how come you didn't get angry when they said that? I thought, what do you mean? We need to show Jesus. Cooler, calmer, collective discussion will get you a lot further than complaining, anger, and yelling. I can yell at the building department all I want about a bill. It ain't going to change the bill. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. I can complain about it. It ain't going to happen. There's a lot of people that do. The world needs to see Jesus. The world don't need to see the world. And it's our job to carry Jesus wherever we go. So I challenge you to go out here today. Get excited. Put a bigger smile on your face. Speak encouraging words. Say thank you more. We just had a depth interview with employees at the plant, going through some difficult times at the plant. You know what the number one thing the employees said? More than money. Now, most people want more money, right? The number one thing they said, I wish people would just say thank you more. That they appreciate the job I do. That was higher on the list than money. Now true, money was on the list and they do want <laughs> But the thing was, they're saying, I appreciate things, but I'd like somebody to tell me they appreciate them. People are looking for an encouraging word. What more encouragement is there than Jesus? So this morning, as we get ready to close... If you don't have peace of Jesus, I pray that you'll take this time to focus on Jesus as we sing. Say, Lord, I've gotten off track. Lord, I've not carried it the way I should. I need the peace of the gospel. I need to be able to go out and not fear the enemy, but know that I'm protected by your armor, that you're with me. I pray that you'll seek that out. And if you're here this morning and you've never called on Jesus to be saved, Make that decision this morning. Today is the day to be saved. Let Jesus come into your heart. Let him go with you. Watch over you. But most of all, accept the gift of grace that he has for you in salvation. So as we sing this morning, prepare your hearts. Open yourself up to God. And allow him to give you the gospel of peace.